especially glad that you're here, and we hope that you'll feel at home. Uh, if you're visiting, we would ask you, maybe on your way out the door, there's a uh, sort of a visitor's table or desk out there. Could you just stop by there and let them know that you're visiting? Uh, we'd love to have a record of your visit so that we might answer any questions we have about our church or our services. And uh, and so please do stop by there if you're visiting today. Now, uh, we'd like for you just to just humor me a little bit. I just want you to stand up for just a second. Everybody should stand up and stand up. It's all right. We'll kill you. All right, I want, you to, I want you to turn and face someone. Doesn't matter who you just turn and face someone. Hopefully it will not be too unpleasant of an experience to face someone. So there you go, just face somebody.
going to give you a little bit of a prayer update because we have had several folks going through some uh, unusual and sometimes difficult situations. Teresa, Teresa, wave your hand to us. You're right over there. Teresa has uh, gallbladder surgery tomorrow. Lonnie Bowen's been moved to rehab. We are thankful for that. Anthony Wiggins, last I knew, is now home but has a long ways to go for recovery. Keep praying for him. Lynn Maroney is continuing cancer treatments. I saw her this last week and, and she was in pretty good spirits. I really appreciated that. Shel Brady is going to see another surgeon for a second opinion about a growth on her spine. And, and uh, Tracy Ludwig, Tracy Ludwig has been discharged from the hospital, but we were told in my class this morning that we, we were told that she passed out several times yesterday, and so she's still having issues. And so uh, do pray for Tracy. Candy, as you know, had thyroid surgery this past week, and she was really encouraged because her blood pressure was normal and her heartbeat was regular. And just before I started my class today, I got a text from her saying I'm not going to be able to be there. My blood pressure and heart rate are cleared up. And she said, I, it's, it's just strange because they were both perfect. And that's what this surgery was supposed to be fixing for her. So let's be praying for Candy for sure, okay? And, uh, and uh, trust that she'll be fully recovered before long. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of being here today. Thank you for the assurance that once we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, he's forever ours. Our eternal life is already going on. And we thank you. We thank you for the assurance that we can have in our hearts. Once we have received him, we thank you for the peace that can, can control us, can guard us, can, can direct our steps. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, said Isaiah, because he trusts in you. We realize today that to the degree that our mind is stayed on Christ, we can know your peace. Thank you so much for this privilege. Now as we give back to you for your work, we pray you will bless the offerings that we give as we have the privilege of sharing in what you do. And we pray that you will just use this money to accomplish your purpose throughout our community and throughout the world. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right after the offering, Brianna Brad is going to come and share a song with us. And then Pastor Jeff Mitchell is with us again today.
This song is a beautiful presentation of what the cross represents. And when Jesus was on the cross, you know, we put him there. And our sins and the things that we do are the reason he was on that cross. And in the song, she says, Oh, let this be where I die. My Lord with thee, crucified. And when I first heard those words, it, like I said, it floored me. Because I had to ask myself over and over, what does that mean for me? And she opens up the song saying, God, I give you what I can today. These scattered ashes that I've hid away. So for me, bringing everything I have to the throne of God and literally just giving all the things, all the pieces of me that I've hid away, that I didn't want him to be a part of, all the little pieces, I just want him to be a part of every piece of my life. And this is literally a song of surrender to what Jesus did at the cross. I hope that this song speaks to you the way that it did to me. Uh, this song has transformed me and how I pictured Jesus on the cross because I believe.
honest, uh, one of the things that moves me more than anything is to hear people speak from the heart. Whether they're singing or whether they're speaking, and she just sings from her heart. Amen. When a message touches you, uh, you want to try to convey that to others. It's not always easy to do, but I have news for you. You just did a great job. I heard you. Amen. I hope that everyone else did too. Uh, this morning, I want you to go ahead and just turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians in chapter 5. And hold your place there for a moment. Because that's where we're going to start. First week we met, we talked about having the right attitude as we look forward in the coming year. Paul gave us some great pointers on how we can go about looking at the year that's before us and the attitude that we should have as we move forward as his people. And then last week we looked at the reality of how that is able to come to pass in your life and mine as we use the principles of God's word as our guideline. If we use anything else other than the God's word, then we're never going to be able to achieve that in our life. And so we learn the significance of the infallible word of God being applied to our lives on a daily basis. Today, I asked you last week to be praying for me and for whatever reasons, I'd already picked out four sermons that I wanted to do during this time with you. And um, before any one I met, any conversation I had, I had already planned to preach this sermon this Sunday. And I asked you last week to be praying about it because I want to talk to you today from a practical viewpoint of what our worship is about in the church today. I've had the privilege to be all over the globe. In my years in the Marine Corps, I spent a lot of time traveling, and I saw 26 countries. And I had just gotten saved right before I had gone into the service, so I made a point to go in every synagogue and every temple and every church or whatever kind of building you want to call it that I could in every country that I went to. And I saw people in Africa jumping straight up and down as fast as they could, nonstop for an hour, crazy. I've seen people who were dead quiet and they're laying before their faces on the ground, on a mat, in just complete silence. I've been over in Korea where people raised their hands and shouted and it seemed like it was chaotic and we call it charismatic here in our country and yet in their own special way they were worshiping God and they were doing it everywhere I went over there in that country. And then I saw men and women and children bowing down to a wooden idol called Buddha. So big I couldn't imagine it with my eyes as I saw it, but it was amazing to see. And I went into every kind of place that I could have tried to even go into a mosque and they wouldn't let me in. But that was okay. I saw all kinds of forms of worship. And ways that guys, gals, and children try to express what's going on in the inside of them, how God's speaking to them unto their Lord. And I've been in churches ever since I've been saved, from mega churches to the smallest churches of 8, 10, 12 people. And I've seen churches where people try to do what they can with what they have and the resources and the people and the talent that they have to come together to worship the Lord. Today I want to talk to you about that on a practical level. I find, as I said to you last week, there are a lot of answers to a lot of questions that we have even today as Christians. It doesn't matter how long you've been one. They're found right here in God's Word. I know uh, all of us sitting here in this room at some point in time or another have uh, experienced static electricity. How many of you have ever experienced that experience in your life? Isn't it great? You're sitting there minding your own business and someone walks up to you and it's a little pool in the house and there's socks feet and touches you and knocks the crap out of you with a low voltage. Kind of thing. I can't believe I just used that word. <laughs> but it's what happens when there's this positive uh, buildup of this electrons in your body and when you ground it out on someone or some metal optic it shocks sometimes you or someone 
it can't, it's got to release itself. It's a chemical uh, issue that goes on in the human body that you're probably not even aware of that's happening, what's going on in your body, but it, it comes out. It has to. I like it in unto worship when we come together as God's people. We come together now that we've spent time in God's word and we've spent the week in his presence and we come in fellowship. And hopefully there's been a positive buildup of electrons, if you will, inside of you going on so that when you come together and you rub shoulders with one another and you begin to express yourself to each other, something's got to happen. Sometimes I'd like to do that. I had a sister in the church that used to tell me I should carry me a little jar, mason jar of bumblebees in them. So when there are those lacking in the church, I could just go out there and drop them down their dresser or their back or something and get them to wake up a little bit. I threatened to use a cow prodder once, but that didn't work. Look, what I'm trying to say to you this morning is you can't generate something that's not there. Did you hear that? If you're not excited about the Lord and you can't be moved about what God's doing, you can't generate that. It's got to come from the heart. True worship comes from the heart. So this morning I want to talk to you. I want to ask you a few questions and I want you to just, just hear me out this morning. I don't want you to think about styles and preferences and your view and his view and their view. Or I want you to just listen to what let's say the Lord and then we'll try to sum it up at the end. So when you come together each week here at the fellowship at Antioch Baptist Church, what's your worship about? Your own individual worship. The song that they played up here a minute ago with these ladies standing across it, they don't know it, but this morning early I got up and I was in my living room by myself and I was listening to Amazing Grace played by a jazz player on a piano and I was just brought to tears. And then they, of all times, sing the same song in here this morning. And I lost it again just a minute ago over there. I don't know where that comes from sometimes. I'll tell you a true story. A couple of months ago, and this hasn't happened to me in years, I was out in my yard working. And out of the blue, I was listening to my little headset, and I had a song on it, and I don't know who it was by. I just, uh, he knows my name is all I know the name of the song. And this gal is singing this song. And I want to tell you something. It hit me like a ton of bricks. In that moment, I realized that in his, his eyes, I matter. In his eyes, I'm, I have worth and value. And I began to, to cry and I began to weep. And I'm in front of my neighbors. I don't know if they were even out because I didn't really focus on that. And I raised my hands. I dropped my little picker and my bucket that I was putting pine cones in and I raised my hands and I stood there for 20 minutes literally just weeping and praising the Lord. And I was like, I, I didn't care. And I felt such a freedom to just worship God right there in my yard the way I wanted to. And I didn't care if my neighbors laughed and I didn't care if they thought I was inappropriately dressed in my shorts and t-shirt or what. I just worshiped the Lord and I felt such a freedom. I'll never forget that moment. There's been others, but I'll never forget that moment. I experienced a moment of worship that was real. No strings attached. Do you come to truly worship the Lord in spirit and truth when you come to this church or do you come with another agenda? Do you have others in mind, or do you have him in mind when you worship? Well, the scripture has something to say. The first point that I want to share with you this morning is worship isn't about us, it's about him. If you have turned there to Ephesians this morning, I want you to listen to these words, and I, I, I pray that you bear with me because I like to explain things as I go through them so as you understand what it's really saying here to us. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 17 through 20, he says these words. He says, therefore, do not be unwise, 
But understand what the will of the Lord is. And so it, literally he's saying, I don't want you to be misinformed or, um, you know, ignorant of what God's will is for your life. And so I'm about to tell you what God wants for you and what he longs for his people. He goes on to say, um, and do not be drunk with wine, which is in dissipation. And by the way, that means to be seduced or corrupted by. But the contrast is, is the opposite of things that are in this world that people find to try to help them to cope with life, which never works, by the way, is the spirit of the living God in you. And when you're abiding in him and his spirit's abiding in you, it's able to control you and fulfill your needs and your wants and your desires in such a way that you don't desire any of those other things. You don't need some substance to make you feel good for a little bit. The Lord can provide all of that you need. And so in that verse, it's saying, look, look to this instead. Be filled with the Spirit, uh, speaking to one another. That means it's encouraging fellowship. You have to come together in order for you to experience that. And, and so forth, he says, speaking to one another in Psalms. And literally, that is the Psalms of the Old Testament. If you work through that and study that, you'll find that's exactly what it's talking about. Your piano player last Sunday... Uh, evening played a, a piece from the 70s of so one of the praise songs that came out that we, you know which came out on the scene in the 70s and caused such a rift in the church and it was not accepted very well but she played it here and I didn't see anybody getting upset and it's a praise song and you know what it was it was literally the scriptures right out of the songs now nobody sang it she played it but when she played it I was going through the words in my mind and it took me back to when I used to listen to that CD of that praise strings CD of mine. Well, back then, I'm sorry, it was cassettes. <laughs> and I still have some make trucks. But anyway. And my son said, what is that? So anyway, so, um, you know, it took me back as I was sitting there listening to her play that. It took me back to when we were crossing the Atlantic Ocean for 14 days. And we're on a ship and I'm in a bunk with a bunk bed about that far away from my head and I'm on there and I would go there in, in solace and I would listen to my CDs of songs and I remember those spray strain songs that I got when I was over in Korea. I got it for a buck. I would try buying a, well it was in the black market, but it was a buck. But anyway, so I bought it. I'm like, it's Christian. It's got to be good. You know. And I listened to it all the way over there and stuff and different ones and I remember it took me back. I went right back to 1986 right there on that pew last Sunday evening. Why? It was another special time for me. God used music to impact my life. And I'm going to tell you something. There's another individual who had the gift of music that was beyond anyone who's ever been created. His name's Lucifer. And I assure you, he's trying to do all he can to use that against us today. Look, it's about him. Let's go back to the verse there. It says in Psalms... And then it mentions hymns. Originally, those were uh, songs that were special ones that they took out of the Old Testament that had to deal with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they used them for special occasions in the temple and the synagogues and special events during feasts and Passovers and so forth. And then it goes on to say spiritual songs. And if you study that, you'll know that it's really a testimony of the people, the songs of them expressing uh, to God, back to God, of what... Um, uh, what the Lord's doing in their life and what he's done for them and so forth and so on. That's the spiritual songs in this passage. Things that are giving back to God in a testimony. But here's the neat thing. Singing and making melody. It's interesting that the wording there in that in the Hebrew uh, or the Greek uh, uh, is a description of instruments in our churches. Instruments that were used. And by the way, if you go over there and you see what they use compared to what they don't have any of these up there. They don't have those kind of drums. They have more drums like this, you know, kind of stuff. And they've got flutes and horns that you've never seen before, some of them. But they make music and it's beautiful with it. Here's the best part. That's why I said something has to happen when true worship is, it's in the heart. And where does it come from? It comes from the heart. And to whom is it? To the Lord. Giving things always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what he's done in your life. 
That's true worship. When your expression is back to God in a gratitude of thanks, to say, Lord, thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you're doing. That song that she sang up here just a minute ago obviously touched her in a very special moment in time in her life, and she shared that with you. You know, I've heard people say, well, I guess you had to be there. That's right. In her spiritual moment, and God speaking to her in that special way, guess what? She was there, and she expressed it wonderfully. And hopefully you received the message as she shared that message with us in song. That's worship, folks. Where it didn't point towards the individual, it pointed towards him and about him. Secondly, worship isn't just about here, it's about there. What do I mean by that? Well, in Luke chapter 15 and verse 10, it says, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Since the days of Adam, throughout history, those who have repented of their sin and have believed upon our God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, there's something going up in heaven at the same time when that happens in a person's life that we don't even know about. The angelic host, we don't even know how they're doing it or what they're doing. We just know there's joy and there's celebration and there's excitement in the air. Someone just got saved! We don't know if that's what they're doing. We don't know if trumpets sound every time there's... They have to constantly be sounding, by the way. But there's joy in heaven over what's happening. Why? Because it was the main purpose for the Son. To seek and save the lost. And He came to this earth to do that. And there should be rejoicing over that. When you hear in your hearts that someone just got saved, it should cause you to say, Praise the Lord! I had someone say to me the other day, Oh, praise God, another sister. I get excited every time I hear about someone getting saved. And I said, Well, praise the Lord. That's why I shared it with you. you know. My daughter was sitting and doing her homework. For you teachers that are in here that know her, it's a good thing. Monday evening, doing her homework, listening to her CD, the song Messiah had come on, and I was sitting in the living room typing, and my wife and son are in the other room. All of a sudden, my daughter just begins to cry uncontrollably. And I thought something had happened, something wrong, like you know, pain or something. So I ran in there, and my wife came running out of the room. She's sobbing so uh, uncontrollably that she had to take a few minutes to settle down. She's crying so hard. And we tried to ask her again and again, ask her, please tell us what's going on, honey, please, tell her, settle down. Or, you know, I didn't want to stop her from crying if she wanted to cry, but if, you know, we got to find out what's going on, right? You're concerned. She says, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven where you and mom are going. I want to be with you guys for all eternity. I didn't get saved. Amen. 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 And a little bit of rejoicing was going on about 15 minutes later in heaven because we took her in the living room and our son gave his testimony to her and told him, told her how he got saved. And then we shared with her how to get saved and the gospel and then make sure that she understood it. And she says, I want to do that now. And she accepted the Lord. And when she asked the Lord in her heart, and I said that prayer and she finished, she goes, yes. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. That's what that's about. It's not just about here. It's about there. There are those in heaven who rejoice on Monday evening around 6 o'clock. Mom and Dad did a little dance too. <laughs> Been praying for her for some time now. But there's a third one. The Word of God informs us that worship isn't just about now. It's about then. I know what we've got going on down here is great, and it's wonderful. There's coming a day, folks, when we're going to worship together like you've never seen in your life. Follow with me over to the book of Revelations in chapter 19. I've asked them to put it up there for you in case you didn't have a Bible. But follow along with us in verse 19, starting in verse 1. I love reading these passages because it describes what's going to happen one day, and we get to be a part of it. After these things, I heard a loud voice, a great multitude in heaven saying, 
Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he has avenged her the blood of his servants shed by her. And again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and said to me, These are the true sayings of God, and I fell at the feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not, that I am your fellow servant. But listen to what he says. And of your brethren who have the testimony of who? Jesus. Worship God, the angelic host says. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Even the angelic host that is created in heaven that you and I cannot see with our eyes. Perhaps you may have entertained one throughout your lifetime. Even they say, listen, if you're going to worship something or someone, worship God the Father and the Son. Amen? That's what you should be worshiping. Not man, not things on this earth. You worship now, yes, but you're going to worship them together. It leads me into my last point. And that is worship isn't just about one, it's about many. I love this passage. It's again another one there in Revelation chapter 5. In verses 11 through 14, it says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, and that's a lot of people. Amen? That even heaven itself and God himself does not put a number on it. Saying with a loud voice, now, how many of you are ever sang in church loudly? I sit in front of church members all the time, and sometimes I could just, I just sit and listen to them, and they just carry me away with the sound. And other times, it's like I turn around and look at them, and I say, is everybody awake? It's okay. You don't have to have your worship on all the time. But there's coming a day, even if you're one of those quiet inner kind of worshipers, you're going to take this vocal cords and tongue that God has given you with a new body, and you're going to sing a song like you've never sung before, and it's going to be loud. Amen? I don't care what people say, you know, about how you sing or not sing. We give my wife a hard time. But she sings from the heart. Amen? That's all that matters. Amen? Right, sister? Amen. You're going to sing this song, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. You need to be practicing it already. And by the way, a lot of our praise and worship songs today already sing a lot of these songs, a lot of these verses. The passage we just read in chapter 19, we sing those songs and those verses out of those uh, uh, books already. It goes on, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such are in the sea and all that is in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power to who? Pay attention. To who? It's not about these people up here. It's not about the pastor up here. It's not about the giftedness of an individual and their eagerness to want to show you what they've learned and how they've dedicated themselves to studying how to play an instrument. And it's beautiful, and yes it is. But it's still not about them. It's about Him. It says it right here. Him who sits on the throne and the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped Him who lives, who lives forever and ever. coming the day when you will worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And I have a feeling 
They're not going to have to come around and ask you to sing that song. It's going to be a new song. If we worship Him in truth, we can never go wrong. If worship is about Him and not us, and they are more than here, and then more than now, and many believers instead of one, then should we take the Apostle Paul's advice when we read these words out of Colossians in chapter 3 and verses 1 through 4, where he says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. Oh, the things on this earth can really cause us to venture off. But I love these words. For you die. How many of you all think about yourself as an individual who has died and no longer do you possess your own being? You've been bought with a price. You are a purchased product, if you will, of the Lord of Lords and King of Kings to do as He wills. As you submit to that and you say, I'm here, O Lord, here am I. Do whatever you want to do with my life kind of mentality. You've given up all control on this earth. And you say, Lord, you've got it all. I'm following you. Not you following me in my path. The scriptures lead us through that. Paul says, look, for you died. And your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Oh, glorious day that will be. We get to sing a new song. We get a new robe. We get to ride behind Him coming in His glory. We get to reign and rule with Him. Oh man, I get carried away when I start reading Ezekiel and Isaiah and Revelations and I think about the future and what we're going to be doing. And you get to say to yourself, I get to be a part of that someday. And we try to imagine with our finite minds, as little as they are, what that's going to be like. And I got this for you. We don't even ever come close. We can't. That's why I can only imagine we're such a popular song. Because we can only imagine in our own minds. We have no clue what it's really going to be like one day. To be in the presence of the Lord who died for your sins and mine. And for Him to take His hand and wipe your tears away. And by the way, there will be tears. And every knee will bow. And He'll get to say to you, for those who have believed by faith, Welcome to my home. It's yours now. I've been working on it for thousands of years. I'm going to tell you, you're going to do a little show. I got a feeling some of you that are really. You're going to come out of your shell, and people are going to look at you and think, Is that brother such and such? <laughs> yes, I did! You better believe it is. I got the joy, 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 joy. Where? Oh, and some of you know it. <laughs> well, I um, I wanted to spend the rest of our time doing something. <coughs> I told you I was going to make up for last week. I held you over a long time last week. I know. <laughs> and so I'm going to make up for it today. You'll eat, you'll beat everybody at the restaurant. Um. Like I said, I've been all over the world and I've seen people worship in so many different ways. I've seen Korean folks go, you probably don't understand this, they'll take their vacations when they have vacations every year and as a family they go to this mountain that's over there in Seoul, Korea. And I, I can't, I'll never forget this, we're walking down through the, the woods and stuff and we're humping through the woods. There's this glow of lights and stuff in the evening time up along this whole entire mountain, as far as you can see. And um, later I asked one of the guys that was with us in the Korean army, uh, what in the world all those lights were all about up there, because people live up there. He said, oh no. He said, that those Christian people. Those Christian people go up there. Oh, I can't talk like that, it's bad. Those Christian people go up there on their vacations. And they spend the whole week camping out in tents 
And all day long during the day, they gathered together and they prayed for God to do a miracle in Seoul, Korea. And don't you know that their faithful praying and asking God to do a revival in their community has one of the largest churches in the globe in Seoul, Korea? I got a chance to see that church. And this is back in the 80s now. It may not be as big now, but back then it was humongous. The biggest church I'd ever seen in my life. Thousands upon thousands of Korean people there just worshiping the Lord. And literally, if you were to walk in, you'd think it was sort of charismatic, chaotic, and out of control. But no, when it came time for that preacher to preach, man, they shut up. They quit worshiping. And it was as quiet. And he's, I didn't believe you You know, I, was, I mean, and when he would do that, they go, yeah. I mean, when one did more, yeah. I mean, it was the little kids and everybody. And they would clap hands when the preacher would say something. And I would sit there and I was like, well, this is great. We wouldn't do church like this in the States. <coughs> I sometimes I wonder, folks, I've been all over it and I've seen so much of that. And I've seen it in the big churches and the small churches and I've seen it in the southern and I've seen it in the, you know. The... <coughs> and I ask myself, are we really doing this right? Where did we learn this from? Is this just learned behavior? I mean, do we truly, really express to the Lord how we honestly feel? Or are we so reserved that we're afraid that if we let out a peep, somebody might think that's a little not loving? And there are times that I just, I lose it and I don't care and I cry and I laugh as I'm crying and I clap and I want to clap. And I have to be with you, as a pastor, having to go to a pastor's conference and have to let loose and praise the Lord and clap my hands in church and afraid that somebody might get mad if I do this. And when I go back to my own church, I got news for you. I'm not doing that anymore. But there have been so many books written on this issue of worship wars. I go to conference anymore, and when they even mention the subject, I just go, oh. Really? Are we still struggling with this one? Do we still have to tell everybody what our style and preference is and, and take a stand on it and be so dogmatic about it that we have no open mind about someone else's way of doing worship? My Bible says clearly if they come in my name and they preach Jesus, let them do it. He told that to his own disciples. If they preach Jesus, let them preach it as long as it's truth. Here's the thing. I don't know about this. I don't have it. You know, do we have an acapella church? I've been in those. Literally, where there's no instruments, just people singing. That's okay. Amen? Do we have a piano or no piano? Do we have a guitar or no piano? Kids are no drums or drums or bongos. My wife and I went to a church here last month and they've got tambourines and bongos and cymbals and they've got a, I've been in big churches where they have a full orchestra. I've been in churches where they do dance, creative dance. Um, uh, you name it. I've seen it all. Some of the people that you listen to on the, on the radio probably, some of your superstar hero preachers on the radio, go to their church and you'll get a taste of worship that you probably thought, well, I didn't know they did that here. Tony Evans, Chuck Swindoll, Stanley, you name them, I've been to all other churches and I've seen a whole different array of way that they worship the Lord. Here's what I've concluded after all the years of studying. I spent one year, and I challenge you to do this, I spent one year going from Genesis to Revelation and I looked up every verse that has to do with worship, praise, music, music instruments, you name it. And I wrote them all down and I went back and I read and studied every one of those verses. Do you know what the truest form of worship the Bible declares in Scripture is? It isn't song. It's when this is proclaimed. The Word of God is the key source that leads people to worship. Look, I hope you're not turning me out here this morning. I was really leery about doing this. i got to be honest with you. I don't care if you're young, and I don't care if you're a praise band contemporary, 
or if you're a Southern Gospel. I don't care if you're Bluegrass Gospel. I don't care if you're Classical. I listened to a jazz guy play Amazing Grace this morning, and I got news for you. I was impressed. Because I, I got a secret for you. I'm not a big jazz fan. Amen. And the music that my mom and dad made me listen to when I was growing up isn't my kind of music. My mom used to make me watch Elvis every time he came on TV. <laughs> One more time, we had to sit in our living room. My dad made us watch Billy Graham. My mom made us watch Elvis. <laughs> I had to listen to Tom T. Hall or Merle Haggard, Tammy Whitehead, Moore Wagner, all those people. And, and I said, when I grew up, I said I would never listen to the country as long as I lived. Rock and roll, pop, instrumental. I have news for you. Brother Keith and maybe others may have a better answer than I do, but I'll be honest with you. I've yet to find a real good answer to give people other than this. As long as the songs and their theology is correct, and it points people to worship the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, it's not my place to judge the genre, or the style, or the instruments, or the sound, whether it's soft, whether it's loud, or whether it's whatever. It's not my place. If God leads this person to beat on a drum as hard as he can, I've watched people play five-gallon drums and sing Christian music. That was interesting. True story. I grew up little that I did uh, um, in the church, being exposed to gospel music and stuff. My grandfather was a Baptist church planner in Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio, and uh, he led the music in those churches and so forth. And he was a music director, so I heard you know hymns my whole life and loved, them, fell in love, um, and you know, gospel music and stuff, so forth. We go back in the days where you had the the tent revivals and the gospel groups would come and stay there all week kind of thing, have dinner on the grounds. Um, and that's what I grew up here. I went to Houston, Texas right after I got saved and um, a gentleman in the church that I was attending, the Baptist church, he said, hey, you want to go to a Christian concert tonight with me? He says, I got two tickets. I said, sure, let's go. What time? So we go there. The front row tickets were sitting right down in the front row. And, you know, all of a sudden, it's time the lights dim down. And colored lights come on. Smoke starts coming out of the stage. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> same church like I used to back home, you know. And don't you know, the old striker band come out there. And then the res band came out there. And then Petra came out there. And the whole time I'm going... He said, what do you think, what do you think? I said, I don't know, I can't hear a thing. He said, what do you think, what do you think about that? Man, I got all their CDs, I love them. Their words praise Jesus and everything. And I'm sitting there thinking, I never heard one of them, but I'll get them. And I'm like, he says, isn't it great that we can have this alternative? And I said, I don't know, brother, this is all new to me. And I learned to love a brother who was so excited about the Lord. And every time that he was talking about the Lord, he'd say, isn't God awesome? And he'd buy shirts, God is awesome. You know, and he was just one of those guys. And I said, you know what? If that causes you to worship the Lord, have it. As long as you worship the Lord and live for him, I'm not going to judge you on the style of music you listen to. It's not my place. Look, I want to talk to you as a church because I know that everybody in here has been to all kinds of churches over your lifetime. So, as a kid late. Um, you've got to find a place to come together on this one, as every church does. <coughs> Young or old, something that I cannot stand, and don't take this the wrong way, please. It's just me. You know, I'm sharing a personal thing with you right now. Okay? Uh, my children like to listen to Christian rap. I've tried. I've not banned it. I've said, no, God forbid, listen to that my home. I've not banned it, but 
point. What I say is this to them, as I say to any believer who comes up to me about a controversial view, about their preference, about this stuff called music, called worship wars, is this. If it's not about God, and you can't be encouraged to serve the Lord, then guess what? You probably shouldn't be listening to it. I don't care what the job is. Look, there are some Christian hymns that I have heard over the years, folks, that are theologically in a, in a, inaccurate. I've had them pointed out to me when I went through Bible college, so I know that they were. Theologically, they were incorrect. You cannot lose your salvation in Jesus Christ. And one of our favorite hymns promotes that. And so I learned to, you know, to check that one out. Or I learned to put it up here. So when I do hear it, I don't touch the person. I just got turned off. <laughs> that was my cue, Lord. So that when if they ever come back again and they say, oh, they've made some improvements in 
so forth. And then on the other end, you have the other side where they say, oh, they're a little too charismatic. You know. And I'll be honest with you, I've got to say this from a pastor's heart and uh, someone who's been uh, you know, in the ministry since I was 19 years of age. I don't know how you fix this issue. I really don't. All I can tell you is this. I've learned to accept it all across the board. I listen to all kinds of music. As long as it glorifies His name. And I can find myself worshiping Him when it's all said and done. I'm on board. I've learned to watch people from the heart sing to the Lord from all kinds of different styles. It doesn't matter. I love you. And I don't even know you. Amen? Well, let me just say to you, um, I'm praying for you guys. Really am. My wife and I are praying for what God's doing here and going to do in the direction you're headed and all that. And I know this is tough. But just trust in the Lord and he'll, he'll take you through. Amen? Father God, I just pray this morning. I know this is a little uh, unorthodox style of preaching. A little candid talk, but truth of the matter is my heart goes out to churches. And I've been in so many to see the strife going on. We have learned to love one another. Like the scripture tells us. To. We have to learn to be able to come together as mature ladies and gentlemen of the gospel. Sit down and work it out. And I promise if your whole heart and attitude is to worship Him, to glorify Him, it'll work out in the end. But if it's about individuals and preferences, we'll never get along. We'll always be at enmity with one another. And we allow the enemy to win. And I pray that not be the case in this church. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ, you cast him as far away from here as you possibly can. We don't need his doctrine in this church. We need Christ in this church. To exalt his name above all names, the name of Jesus. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Maybe, maybe